In this presentation, I'm going to give a quick outline of the history of Western philosophy. It's a big job um, and we don't have much time, so it's going to be very fast, but I'll do my best. So I've drawn a big timeline and I've used really some big themes and eras that I think can help understand the history of Western ideas better. And we start in Greece, 400 BC, 5th century BC, with Socrates and the pre-Socratic philosophers. So there, were, there, was, there started to be a tradition of philosophy for some time before Socrates came, and we call all the philosophers before Socrates the pre-Socratic philosophers. And there are some amazing figures there, like Pythagoras and lots of other thinkers um, that really helped Socrates form his own ideas. Yet, we often think of Socrates as the father of Western philosophy. Interestingly, though, he didn't really write anything down that we have today, so there's no written legacy at all. Um, and a lot of what we know about Socrates comes from his student, Plato. Plato studied under Socrates for years and years and years, and he absolutely revered, revered him and adored him. And um, Socrates was killed, he was condemned to death because his ideas were very threatening to the government of the time. And that really traumatized Plato. And Plato started writing about Socrates and his ideas, and then developed his own ideas. And Plato wrote mainly dialogues, and in those dialogues, Socrates features as a character. Um, so it's, they're like plays almost. And so Socrates is always the most witty of all the characters. He's really um, shown in a very positive light. And it's quite entertaining, really. So it's a good way to understand philosophy, to read Plato's dialogues. We'll come back to this in a minute and talk about his actual ideas. Um, so you have to understand that it's very hard to distinguish Socrates' ideas from Plato's ideas. Because Plato wrote um, a lot about Socrates, we don't quite know what came from Socrates and what came from Plato. Although we know that some of his later um, writings contain more and more of his ideas. And then Plato himself um, started his own school called the Academy. So all the words you know now, like academic, academia, they all come from Plato's first university. He himself had another amazing student called Aristotle, who himself started a school called the Lyceum. Um, and I think Aristotle is often underrated. I personally like Aristotle more than Plato. I think he's, he was just amazing, but he is a product of Plato's teaching, so we can't really discredit Plato too much. But Aristotle's problem was that, first of all, a lot of his writing was lost, and secondly, it's, he didn't write very well. It, <laughs> I think it's really confusing at times, and it's, it can be difficult to write. Um, I like his writing, but I think a lot of people find it hard to read, uh, whereas Plato's writing is very engaging. So I think Plato came down um, in, hi in the history of ideas better than Aristotle. And yet Aristotle was the most amazing man. He studied not only philosophy, but so many other things. He's one of the first people who wrote um, what we can call now biology and zoology and some psychology and he did he gave some amazing contributions to ethics and political philosophy metaphysics uh, philosophy of religion he was just amazing so these three are really the trinity of ancient greek philosophy socrates plato and aristotle so they all taught each other well socrates taught plato who taught aristotle and I want to look at just one classic example of um, ancient Greek philosophy, and it's Plato's um, theory of forms. 
Plato's theory of forms claims that there is a world somewhere, an ideal world, where the form of everything, the concept, the blueprint of everything is present. So it's, it's quite an abstract, difficult idea. So I'm going to use an example that is not Plato's example, but it's a simple example. So these are all different chairs, as you can see. These are chairs in a real, visible world, material world that we live in. And according to Plato, um, they are all reflection of the idea of the ideal chair. So somewhere in another world, there is that idea of the perfect chair, the blueprint of the chair that then gives birth to all these different chairs. So when an artisan is making a chair, um, he looks towards the idea of the chair. He's got a concept of the chair in his mind, and then he can create a chair. But those real chairs that we would call real are not really real. They're just a pale reflection of the idea of the chair. And every single one of them will be imperfect because they are material and they can decay and they can die. And so the whole world we live in is made of temporary, decaying, material stuff that is nowhere as good as the world of ideas. So that world of ideas is actually the real world. It's the better world. And in that world of ideas, you have all the concepts of everything, all the perfect version of everything. So it starts with very simple things like you know, the form of the chair, he called it the form, the idea, the concept of the chair, is the form of the chair. But actually, much more importantly, um, there is a hierarchy of forms, and so there are certain things like justice, beauty, all these ideas that are in the world of form. And so when we try and create something beautiful, for instance, we look towards the idea of beauty, and then we try and make a pale, imperfect reflection of beauty in the real world, in our world. And he was very interested in justice, so he looks towards the form of justice, towards the ideal idea of justice. And the most important form of all, the, the highest form of all, is the form of the good, which illuminates all the other forms. It shouldn't be a cloud, it should be a sun, really, according to Plato. So this gives you an idea of, so that there's that other world then somewhere. What's interesting is that it seems that Plato really thought it existed. It was there somewhere. It's very interesting. So it's very hard to know whether it's material or not. It's not material, but yet it's, he seems to believe it's somewhere out there. So it's quite complex, but it's very interesting. Um, what's very interesting as well is that it relates to that idea of cosmos that I've put there at the top of everything because I think it explains well the world that the Greek philosophers lived in. So they had the idea that the world was as it is, you know, imperfect, decaying, dying, changing all the time. But that out there, the stars they could see in the sky and the, the moon and the planets were actually perfect. They thought they were perfect objects from the heavens, really. And so they had that kind of dual notion of the universe. It's a very interesting concept, the concept of cosmos. And they were focused on that. They were trying to understand um, that perfection that was out there and that imperfection that was here in this world and the way the world works and that relationship between the perfect and the imperfect, that really sums up a lot of their ideas. And I think Plato's theory of the forms is really the essence of that mentality um, that they developed. Uh, so it's a very important first phase of philosophy. Um, if you think about it as well, the idea that there's a, an imperfect world here and somewhere out there, there is a perfect world, and Plato says, when you die, your soul goes back to the perfect world. 
Um, that really sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like heaven. And a lot of Greek philosophy, I think, influenced Christianity. Um, the New Testament is written in Greek, you have to remember. Uh, so, you know, those concepts are not foreign to Christianity at all. And talking about Christianity, the next phase in philosophy really came in the Middle Ages, and it wasn't the most glorious time, really, as we know, um, although it's often caricatured, but there was a long period of time where not that much happened in philosophy. In fact, you could say it was a step backward in some sense. A lot of the Greeks' writings were lost, or were ignored, or were even destroyed. Um, and suddenly, Christianity and the church, the, the Catholic Church at the time, took over um, the history of ideas. And so everything that came out of that era, to an extent, was related to God. God was the answer to everything. God was at the center of everyone's life. And so philosophy also became influenced by that. And there's some absolutely amazing um, theology that comes from that time, like St. Augustine, Aquinas, were by no means uh, lesser philosophers. They were just brilliant philosophers, especially to come out with philosophy at that time was not easy. <laughs> but they were both um, theologians as well as philosophers. So a lot of the philosophy of the time is actually theology. So that gives you an idea of that era. I don't want to caricature it too much, but it's pretty much what came out of the Middle Ages is, is theology and philosophy of religion. Although there are some other interesting uh, points. Aquinas is really very similar to Aristotle, except that if you take a shaker and put Aristotle and Christianity and mix, you get a cocktail called Aquinas, really. It's just a mixture of the two.